law had been derived, uh, a sailor of a ship uh, was, uh, they were obliged when a sailor of a ship was, was uh, found to provide cure and maintenance, even if it was a sailor of an enemy. Now, this holds true even to today. That is that the uh, judge is obliged, once you've established that you're a man or a woman, I should say, man or woman, and that you're a living man or woman and the flesh lives, the blood flows, then surely you are a natural person and a natural person is identified in canon law of 1983, clearly identified. Uh, you cannot be called a thing once you've established that statement of fact. Okay, does that make clear, Terry? Or not? Yeah, yes, Frank, uh, that's, that's very clear. And uh, is uh, salvage also in they, where they would consider you a thing, salvage, a, uh, also a salvage? Okay. Correct. So th the way it works is if you do not state that you're living, <clears throat> then they can use the fact that there's a CESTA KV against you, uh, they've got the standing of sending the note and you're not responding. The controversy has turned you into a thing, therefore you're a thing, therefore they can apply salvage, therefore they can order that you get taken to a warehouse. Okay? It's that simple. The minute you establish that you are living in a body, flesh, blood, you know, competent mind, you know, however you want to say it, but in that combination, then clearly you cannot be classed as a thing, you must be classed as a natural person. You have to be. Now, as a natural person, you can then request for some form of cure and maintenance. And what you're then asking for is a negotiation. Yeah? Now, I am a living man. I stand here before you, and I apologise, Your Honour, for the mistake of fact. Now, what have I just done then? I've established that I'm a living man. I've established a competence because I've, I've apologised, the mistake of fact. So clearly, I've established competency in the same go. And I have offered to the court a form of remedy, which is to remove the assumed surety between me and whatever the injury is. Now the judge has to respond. Now I'm referring to the judge has left and returned. If a judge has left and returned, then clearly they are trying to use canon law. Clearly. I mean, that, no one should... They're not going to the toilet. I mean, that is, they've, they've come back in, they're going to try and use the second form of law against you. So once I've established that I'm living, I'll apologise for the mistake of fact, then the judge really has to think very carefully. They can't claim contempt. They can't, because I have to be a thing to being contempt. They can't use that. They can't say, I'm not going to accept your apology. Um, the only way they could uh, say that is that I'm trying to apologise for something like murder. Well, you can't apologise for murder because it's not reasonable. It's an unreasonable action. But for most of the stuff that they want to grill us on, a, a, a heartfelt apology of mistake of fact is, is more than enough. So that is the remedy specifically that we should think about in the second form of, of uh, the court. So how does that sit with you, Terry? That's, that's very good. Very good explanation. Now, if it should happen, which would be a risk on the judge's part, if it should happen that they go out a second time and come back, um, can you go through that scenario? Yeah. Well, if they leave for a second time, <clears throat> and I, I doubt that any of you will ever see this, <clears throat> if you do see it, it would probably be in the setting of a tribunal that is in a court of appeal, which is the true court. A true court is always a tribunal. Uh, so don't ever think that the a single judge in a court is a true court. A single judge in a court is an administration court. The, the judge is really sitting there as an administrator. They may call it a court, but it's only when there are three judges is it a true court in the ancient definition of what a court is. But it, it, if, if you do encounter this, and I, as I say, I think it would be very rare with a single judge, then that judge <clears throat> feels pretty confident that uh, they can uh, get you on the third and final form of law, which is Talmudic law. Now, <clears throat> Talmudic law uh, is uh, the implementation uh, over the last 30 years uh, of a form of law that the Khazarian parasites, um, that have had many names, <clears throat> uh, they've called themselves the Venetians, 
They've hidden themselves as the Ashkenazi. Uh, they created the 16th century fictional name where they melded uh, the Yahud and the Israelites and the Menashe and called them all the Jews. Uh, these people are not Jewish. <clears throat> these people are not Menashe. Uh, these people are whatever they want to be. They actually, the one common denominator uh, is that they um, hide in a host, they believe in nothing, and they are certifiably insane, which is a scary thing to think that people who claim to run the planet as bankers, as lawyers, as members of the Anti-Defamation League are certifiably insane. <clears throat> but that's what you're dealing with, people who are certifiably insane. But uh, if you do get a judge that um, wants to, to, to challenge, then what uh, Talmudic law is, uh, is effectively the implementation of the Noahide laws, uh, where uh, unless you uh, establish yourself as being, uh, in their mind, and remember they're coming from extreme ignorance, and this was implemented in extreme ignorance, unless you are Jewish, <clears throat> unless you... Um, uh, abstaining Jewish, uh, then you are, in their mind, a goy, a goyim, and a goy and a goyim in Hebrew is cattle or a dead corpse, uh, and then they have every right, if you are not a property holder, to uh, send you off and have your head chopped off, uh, at the very least, to send you off to jail for 20 years, even if it was a parking fine. And I mean that, even if it's a parking fine, to, to, under the third form of law, they can send you off for 20 years and it's perfectly legal. Um, of course, the, the problem they have is that uh, the whole concept of this Talmudic law is based on ignorance. The Talmud, being written by the Menashe, that's Menes Hay, uh, was written not 300 BCE, 400 BCE in Babylon, it was written in Syria, it was written uh, by the Menashe, and it was written in the 4th century CE. And it was written as an antithesis to imperial Christianity. Furthermore, the Noahide laws weren't written until the 15th century. Furthermore, the, the term Jew, written in the 16th century, when these Khazarian parasites took control and wanted a catch-all phrase in which to hide themselves, when the name appeared, extraordinarily, the word actually means goy. The word Jew means goy, goyim. It doesn't mean Israelite. You can't get Israelite from Jew. You can't even get Yahud from Jew. Something, some divine force was at work in the 16th century when these wicked parasites that now control a lot, a lot of the, the planet today came up with this word to hide amongst good people, honest people, people who have no idea, would, would, would find this extraordinary. Um, and in actual fact, <clears throat> under the law of the Talmud, it is the Israelites that hold the law. It is the Israelites that um, are the just. And it is the Goy that are the ones to be um, gathered up and scattered as dust. So when you stand in a court in the third form and say, Your Honour, I am an Israelite. I am an heir to the Talmud. As it is written, not a goy. I do not call myself a Jew because to, because to call myself a Jew by the 16th century fictional word as opposed to a Yahud or an Israelite, I am saying I am a goy, a goyim. Now if their name was Spiegelman or something like that, because I can assure you that it in, in most cases, it'd be a very brave judge to think that they can run the third form. They would turn white with horror, absolutely white with horror. Because once you establish your standing as one of the chosen, 
of the covenant as an Israelite and show even the smallest understanding of this, they have absolutely no power over you. And in factual fact, the judge risks himself being classed in that form of law as the goy. Now, in order to, to discuss this more, really, uh, the ecclesiastical law, which is still being finalised, needs to be finished. But uh, I think uh, enough is said. Uh, if you go and read the six pronouncements of Eucadia on eucadia.com, then I think you'll find more than enough background to understand exactly what I'm saying and the truth of what I'm saying, that all on this call are Israelites. And that it's only when a man or a woman stands arrogantly up, calling themselves a Jew or behaving and acting for these parasites, that they are the Goy and the Goyim. And under the covenant, they are the ones who are subject to the penalty, not the Israelites. So does that make sense, Terry? Yes, that was uh, explained very, very well. Thank you for that explanation. I think that covers it very, very good. And uh, we did have a question from Guest 16 a little while back. Now that you've covered the court scenario, what about avoiding the court? Right. Well, that is the preferable. And I, and I don't recommend anyone thinking that uh, uh, action in the courts is going to get easier because this is what is going to happen before we answer that question. This is exactly what's going to happen. There will come a time very soon where they'll st simply stop pretending that, that they are uh, representing the law whatsoever. And you will then face uh, the type of, of system that was used to administer the world and civilizations for thousands of years and that is force, fear, and intimidation. So don't think that uh, by doing this that ultimately they're beaten. Far from it. All this is doing is accelerating the dropping of the curtain. And the dropping of the curtain is that these people in any way represent the law, these people in any way care for the law, respect, respect the law. They're not. They're parasites, they're tyrants, they're bullies, they're sociopaths. So all that's going to happen is that over time, that process is going to accelerate. So it is going to come where you'll find that people who are going to court, no matter what they do, are going to find that um, uh, the judges are simply ignoring every form of law, Talmudic law, commercial code, canon law, and it's simply just going back to star chamber stuff in Russia or, or, um, or Nazi Germany where it didn't matter. They just simply send you off to a concentration camp. So just keep that in mind. As far as avoiding the court, which is the preferable uh, thing to do, we go back to the original thing of, of how do they get you to court. <clears throat> well, they can arrest you. They can arrest you and not charge you. And this has happened, uh, as you know, a number of people know that this is something that is usually the most common way of arriving to their court. That is, they'll arrest you on, on some uh, traffic stop, uh, or they'll come to your home, or they'll come to your work. Uh, they'll simply haul you off. Uh, they'll choose to charge you when they choose to charge you. And then the next time you see the daylight, if at all, is, uh, is in the court. But if that's not the scenario, <clears throat> and you're given the opportunity uh, at least to be given some paper, then it will be in the form of a summons, um, a warrant, or some hearing date which will come to you. <clears throat> and when that comes to you, uh, what you have is you have one window, and one window only, to respond. And it is a feature built into the very nature of what a document is. And a document is formed from two things. The front of a document is called the obverse. And the back of a document is called the reverse. Now, this is something that has existed in law from the beginning of law and the beginning of documents in law. 
the obverse 